Good afternoon. Yeah, awesome. Everybody's awake. Wonderful. Again, my name is Ifoma Ebo. I'm here with my colleague Greg I'm from New York City, Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice. And we're here to tell a story about the work that we are doing and have been doing in New York City. But I want to start with a quote from a really great book called Palaces for the People by Eric Klinenberg, where he talks about social infrastructure. And he mentions that social infrastructure, it's not your, your place of business, it's not your home, but it's that third space. It's that space where um, community comes together. It's your parks, your open spaces, your plazas, your libraries. It's those public assets in a community. It can even be the place where you get your hair done, but it's where those social bonds are formed. And this is really the foundation behind the work that we're doing in New York City to use environmental design and placemaking as tools to address public safety. In New York City, we're currently working in 15 public housing developments across the city. And just to give you a sense, the average population in these developments are about two to 3,000 people. And so we're, and the, what connects these 15 different neighborhoods is that they have been historically marginalized. There's um, poor um, unemployment, there's serious unemployment. There's also overcrowded housing. These are the areas where people have felt neglected. But then also, there's also opportunities there. There's a great will with the community and the residents that live there. And so what we've done is we've partnered local police officers with residents in public housing to co-create so solutions that use design as a tool for public safety. But capacity building is really at the heart of those solutions, really training residents and helping them understand what it takes to accomplish the transformation of public spaces and leverage that, that capacity building work work to build leaders in the communities and transform the nature of community safety. And so I'll pass it over to my colleague Greg who's going to talk about the capacity building work. Thank you. Good afternoon. Hello. <laughs> nice to see you. It's my first time in Sweden. It's great. I'm really having a great time. So um, I'm, from, I'm from Canada so I'm used to the weather so it's it's the most normal thing for me. So um, I have a background, as you heard, in policing and urban planning. Um, um, so what that means is I spend my life with the victims of crime and uh, violence, with the people who respond to that, police and so forth, and to the, um, to the criminals. So we hang out with uh, gangs and gang members and people like that. Because, because if you're going to prevent something, you have to understand it. And that was a fundamental premise of our work when we started. We're hired by the mayor's office to look at crime and justice and uh, prevention in these 15 projects that you've heard about. And um, it was, it, we'd been doing this for about 20 years. And I, I gotta tell you, the, the, the thought to go into the biggest city in the US with eight million local, eight, probably 18 million for the whole region, um, with, the, with the, the public housing projects, the projects, you may know from movies, it was like, whoa, how are we going to do that? <laughs> we, I mean, we kind of had a sense of it, but we didn't know for sure. We, we knew the mayor had picked these 15 sites. We knew it was important to do it, and we wanted to make it work. So we started with the principal uh, philosophy called safe growth. Safe growth is crime prevention design kind of on steroids. It's like building capacity in neighborhoods, because we believe neighborhoods are the cornerstone of prevention and safety. If you're gonna do smart cities, they can't be very smart if you continue to have people victimized by crime. That's not terribly smart. So our whole thing was, let's see if we can make this work from a safety perspective, and a planning perspective, and a police perspective with the residents themselves engaged. So that's the thing. So that's the model, that's the book we wrote about some of these projects before New York, and uh, it's on Amazon, you can get it. It tells you some of the case studies we've been working on over the years, but the gist of it is, in 2007, we kind of modernized SEPTED, and we said, let's make it neighborhood-based. And you'll notice there's a tree there, not just because we're environmental people, but because the tree is the key to make good safety. Because the tree has three parts. It has the leaves, it has the branches, 
and it has the roots. And what happens in too much prevention is we hack at the branches, but we don't dig at the roots. And so, let me ask you this. How many times have you heard in your cities in this country where you'll hear politicians wanting to prevent crime by installing public cameras, CCTV? Put your hands up. Oh my God, <laughs> we have a lot of work to do. <laughs> So here's the thing about cameras. Cameras are the, are the leaves of the tree. They're, they're hacking at the branches. I've never heard of a camera yet that builds capacity in a neighborhood. We use cameras all the time, but the key is the context, is how do you do it right? So the, so the context here is how do we build safe communities by not just hacking at the branches with simple technologies, because smart cities are about technology at one level, but it's gotta be technology that's both social and technical. We call it socio-technical systems. That's the key. So we start with, frankly, we start with kids a lot of times, kids and families. And we, we talk about getting them together. And I can tell you this, one of the most powerful ways to start a process, the most powerful way from my point of view, is food especially if you have diverse communities, because they bring so much great food from different parts of the world to the table. And in a lot of community building, they say, get engagement around festivals, around food, around music. That's a really great way to start. But we just start with that. We start with the, I'm getting to know you. Because too often what happens is they go, we have good engagement in our community because we have a good festival. And I love festivals, I'm a musician, I play conga, so I'm always up there doing some weird thing with my band. But that's actually not crime prevention. That's getting to know your neighbor because you wanna care about your neighbor. That's a very different thing. So we start with getting to know each other, developing those initial bonds, and then moving to the next step of doing the work, because the work to prevent crime isn't simple, it's hard work. We knew this was gonna be hard. So here's a case in, in uh, it's actually in New Zealand where we have some folks who are getting the neighbors together, getting the kids together, doing a, a, a painting project on the, on the street. A simple sort of engagement strategy, nothing complicated. Then what you do is you set teams up. So SEPTED, you'll hear about it in a few seconds, I'll describe it, it's using design to minimize crime opportunities by looking at target areas, and we get very technical on how we map the problems out and how we use assets. We have a new digital uh, GPS app we use where residents can map fear, and we can map fear levels out. It's very high tech, but none of that can take place until we get the collaboration going. So in New York, and you'll hear, you'll hear, you'll hear about this in a second from EFOMA, but how, who was involved in the, in the teams, and we had residents, we had uh, housing authorities, we had police officers here, uh, we're doing the training, and everybody gets the training together. So we're all around the same table. It's a very powerful psychological message when you're all being trained with the same language. Because a lot of the c obstacles to getting good prevention done is we don't even speak the same language. We come to the table and the police have one way of speaking, planners have another way of speaking, government officials have another way of speaking. The key is to get them to talk the same language. The training does that. And that's, that was a big part of our work. We trained, oh, I guess about a year. We had, we had one team in each of the 15 sites and the team would formulate their, their, their analysis, they would diagnose the problem, and they would start to formulate their plans. So SEPTED, as I said, is an important part of it. The key is how does SEPTED work? It works by looking at opportunities for crime. When you look at any city, I'll bring for being an example, and you look at where crime clusters, it never is distributed equally. It's always clustered in time, and it's cl clustered in space for very precise reasons. Some of those reasons are it's uh, easy pickings, easy opportunity. They're not there. The lighting is poor there. We did a lot of lighting in these housing projects to increase the lighting for outdoor fear levels, to reduce them. Uh, so physical SEPTED, or SEPTED 1, is about looking at the locations of places, and lo locations of spaces, and trying to minimize crime opportunities. Now this particular one, believe it or not, it's not a great example. This is one of the NYCHA sites, and it's an example of, of some benches with some, um, some chess boards, next to a housing site. And one of the reasons why it's not a really great example is you think it's gonna provide good eyes onto that area. The problem is the eyes are coming from the building, but you see most of the buildings are actually shuttered. 
So nobody is, is, is looking out to see there. And secondly, the distance is beyond what we call the proximic distance. And so far, the people may not have that much ownership over it. So these are the kinds of physical strategies we help residents get a handle on. And then there was second generation SEPTA. That's kind of like the, the social element of, of SEPTA. There currently is an international association called the International SEPTA Association, the ICA. And we do have a European chapter who does first generation SEPTA. Uh, there is, as yet, to my knowledge, no second-generation septet in Europe. Not in Sweden. Yet. But this is how it starts. It starts with placemaking, the social elements of getting people to work together, plan together, and do that sort of cultural thing. So we do a lot of work around, you know, getting uh, placemaking activities, and you'll hear about that in a second. And then we diagnose. We diagnose, we diagnose, we diagnose, we study. We use crime analysis, we use crime mapping. What do residents know about how to put a crime map together? Usually nothing, but that's the point. That's your opportunity to teach them a technical thing that they actually really like. Our digital app is really, we just developed that last year. My colleague uh, is here with me, she'll be at a recession this afternoon, who actually developed the app where they can go around and actually map out their, their areas in terms of fear or in real time. And this diagnosis lets them themselves, when they go to do the plan, say, you know, we think what this happened when we talked to the residents, when we interviewed the, the neighbors, when we looked at the police statistics, and we mapped it out, what happened last year, what happens this year, we can really zero in on the specific problems to give our team something tangible to work on. It doesn't matter what it is. What matters is that they work together and they get excited about it and you build a win. When you build a win, you build some positive esteem. When you do that, the team wants to do more. And that's where we're at in New York. It's exciting, exciting work. And there's the plans. And this was last uh, 18. September, the summer, fall of 18. So they had their plans. We had each neighborhood had a plan based on this building, capacity engagement. And at that point in the game, the plans were going to be implemented. Here's what happened next. Thank you. So as a part of the capacity building, it was important for residents to understand what is mapping? How do I create a map of my development, of my world? And what can a map tell me? So we, we started by training residents on how to create heat mapping. And heat mapping is essentially using colors to illustrate and demonstrate different parts of crime in their neighborhood. So this map that you see in front of you um, uses yellow to show public urination and uses red to show substance abuse. So it's sort of a raise on the de degradation, uh, the gradations of, of crime. And so this was important for residents to really understand why there are certain areas in their community that, not were, that weren't getting utilized. This map, next map is really showing, through their own eyes, social, pro-social activity in their community. Where are young people hanging out? Where are senior citizens hanging out? And really understanding how can we take this pro-social activity and move it to areas that are underutilized. And these underutilized areas look like this. At times, there are places where waste management is poor. There's poor lighting, which means some of the playgrounds don't get used. Um, people feel unsafe. There are some areas that just, they don't have benches. There's no place for you to sit. So there's no, no reason to be on that street corner. But also in these spaces, is great opportunity to transform these places into positive social infrastructure. And so I'll show you a few examples of the ways in which the, the type of capacity building that Greg has done in our program, how that's had an impact on developing leaders and human-centered designers in this work of placemaking to address public safety. This is one development in the Bronx, and it's called Butler Houses. Um, this is a playground that doesn't get used. You can see there's an, an outline in the grounds over here. And that outline is because there used to be a tot lot there that was removed about a few years ago, but never replaced. And so now there's no place for children to play in, and therefore adults don't use this space. And so what it's become, it's become an opportunity for crimes, to, for criminals to take over this space to sell drugs. 
But when another challenge in this community is that there's, but it's an oppor also an opportunity is that there's a Muslim community, there's a Latino community, but they're divided. They operate in silos. They don't work together. And so the team, the resident team thought that this was a great opportunity to transform this space into a piece of social infrastructure that can really create a social bond between all these de different groups and really transform this space. And this was an image that was created by architecture students to work, that worked with the resident team to really create a vision for how this space can be transformed just using paint. And that in, and through the leveraging of this work can also um, attract more opportunity and more funding for more transformation of this space. And what's res resulted is the beginnings of a piece of social infrastructure, using artwork in this public space as a, as a starting point and a di using the public space as a dialogue, a space for dialogue. This is another project in, also in the Bronx. This is Patterson Houses. And often in, in, in public housing in New York City, there are fenced in open spaces. And if open spaces are the place where community happens and your, and your open spaces are fenced in, what does that mean for your sense of community? How do you create opportunities for people to come together? And so one of the challenges here was taking down these fences and tra transforming this particular open space into a piece of social infrastructure. Another challenge in this neighborhood is that they deal with mental health and substance abuse challenges. And so oftentimes residents felt sur found syringes in this particular um, open space. And so they wanted to transform it into a, tr a serenity garden, and that's exactly what they did by removing fencing, adding garden elements, and really creating this space as an opportunity to create partnerships in the community between banks, nonprofit organizations, and the resident team. The people standing in this picture in the, with the black shirts, those are the residents that live there, and the people in the blue shirts are the many different other stakeholders in the community that partnered with this team to make this garden happen. This is another open space in Wagner Houses in Manhattan. And you can see there are two big shipping containers, the red big blocks in the background. that have been there for years, really holding materials and supplies for construction in this development. But why are they there? It's an amazing open space. Why leave this big eyesore there? What it's also done is create a space that people don't want to use or frequent because they're afraid to walk around that, that um, shipping container. And so what this team has decided to do is transform this space into a community center, really using, bringing those shipping containers, shipping containers together, painting it, and really creating a stage out of it. This could be a space for performances, where young people can perform in front of their um, other neighbors, where neighbors can really come together, transforming this open space into a piece of social infrastructure. And so, I want to impress upon you the importance of capacity building, building leaders in communities, and also helping them understand the, how their built environment can really support the kinds of social impact that they want to make, and the importance of social infrastructure in this, in this opportunity for building smart and sustainable cities and addressing public safety. Thank you again. Thank you guys, thank you for coming. Um, and as I was saying, uh, I salute the emotional maturity and intellectual rigor that is demanded to do these complicated tasks. And I was um, thinking while you were talking, can you, should you, how do you communicate to the residents the work that you're doing and the results that it's having? Well, you know, it's important to really meet people where they are, and um, we have these large local convenings um, every year where we bring all the residents in each development together. And, and we really want to harness that energy, and the way in which we harness that energy is give them opportunity to, to say what they want to say. Tell us what are the priorities in your community, but then also tell us what are the ideas, because only they know the true culture of their community and what will and won't work. So that's an important way for us to have this knowledge exchange. We share information with them, they share information with us. It's a bartering system.
And when we did the training, we actually went right to the to the building itself and worked in with the people in their own building. So when we did any kind of walking tour or, or a safety audit or fear mapping, we did it in their own project site. So they got to tell us their story and we got to show them how to do it right there on the scene. So mm -hmm. they knew we were committed to the actual project because we were there with them. Yeah. And my cynical question would be, did they tell you the truth? Did they trust you? D did that take time to build that rapport? Or were they glad that someone showed up and they had a list of things to, to talk about? No, absolutely. And, the, you know, one of the interesting things about the neighborhoods that we've been working in is that they've experienced a history of neglect and marginalization. Mm -hmm. And so we did have to move at the speed of trust, which is a model that we, we use, where it... That's beautiful. I'm going to copy that. Move at the speed of trust. Yeah, and at times it, it's not fast. No. It's very slow. <laughs> and it can feel like you're moving like molasses. But, um, but it's important to move at the speed in which people can feel like they can un that you understand them, that you're listening, and that you can trust them. And I think the capacity building was a huge part of that. It was a long process for Greg to train the residents, but then in that process, they, as they are understanding how government works, how they, as they're understanding how dysfunctions in their environment contribute to, to public safety, they're actually building their trust in that process it, as well. And I assume, Greg, your, your example of food must be important here. Yeah. Eating, sharing bread. But I was yeah. also thinking there's something uh, cognitively. The brain isn't afraid when you eat. By definition, you can't be eating and be afraid at the same time. And that must also contribute positively. Yeah, it, it was important for us to be there, but not to, to stay there. I mean, heard the comment this morning about the consultant comes and write the reports and leaves. That's actually what we didn't do. We went in and we, we stayed forever. It was like Hotel California. Once you get in, you never get out. And that Hotel was kind California. of our philosophy. Hotel California, Hotel Helsing Boy. <laughs> you know, it was like, oh, I'm there forever. We're not there forever, but we're not leaving you. You're not by yourself. It's not we're doing training for a couple of days and then we'll see you later. We did two, two days of training. They did three months of work. We went back, we went back. It was iterative. So each time we went back for the next iteration, their capacity started to increase to the point where your role diminished and their role increased. And uh, what have you seen here that you're excited about? Well, I'm excited for one of the tours tomorrow where they will focus on safer cities. So I'm excited to see that. Um, I think Helsingborg is so beautiful. The vistas are amazing. There's still so much to see and I'm looking forward to it. But are you taking notes and uh, coming back and contributing at and being this, constructive? At this conference, absolutely. I mean, I just went to a, a talk on working with children for, towards placemaking, which has been phenomenal for me as well. So there's lots of learning to, to gain as well in this, in this conference. I was just one last comment when you were talking about the power of color. I was uh, watching a, a documentary about one of your American prisons where they experimented and painted it pink. Everything was pink. Shoes, clothes, walls, toothbrushes. Tutti Tutti was pink. Um, <laughs> and because it's a sunshine story, uh, everyone felt happier, calmer. There were less, what's it called, re-crime. Mm -hmm. um, and they interviewed uh, a cognitive scientist that talked about how the power of pink calms you down. And then they interviewed a hardcore criminal who sat there for a while with tattoos all over. And they asked him, so tell me, how was this experience of this pink um, prison? Has it worked? Yeah, excuse me, this is a quote. Yeah, so fucking embarrassing. I'm never fucking coming back. I'm going a straight <laughs> life. Which I thought was genius. <laughs> That's a good one. There's a <laughs> power of pink. There's, there's, yes. there's, uh, and there's an addendum to that story that we didn't get into in this presentation. And the addendum is this, and this is really a success story. New York and some of the other cities that are driving this m momentum forward are breaking new ground from a criminologist's point of view. And that is, th that is one of the main prison areas in New York is called Rikert's Island. And they've been working to really not only get this training and this counseling and the, the pink walls in the prisons, but to reduce the size of the prison population. The problem with that, of course, is when the prisoners get out of prison, they go right back to the same neighborhoods that led to their, their imprisonment in the first place. What we're doing is we're building the neighborhood so that when they get out of the prison, they come back to a neighborhood that actually has some hope. And the truth of the matter is the Rikerts Island has gone from 21,000 prisoners 10 years ago to 7,000 prisoners today, and the crime rate has gone down. That's success. It's hugely inspiring, and I think what you said uh, is true. In order to uh, create prevention, one needs to understand. Yep. 
Absolutely. Thank you for taking the time to understand and Thank sharing so it much. with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Okay.